Hello. How are you, honey? Good, how are you? Where's Miss Nelma? She's in actually taking Oh, she's taking test. her test today. That's a good thing. Get out of here. Uh, here's what we need. How new are you? It's my first day. In general. <laughs> no, in general. Um, it's all right. Well, I mean, I've, my I'm family's been out this for a while, so. Anybody else need a copy of the application? Yes. Who? Oh. Marie. Well, you have one, though. I don't have it with me, Anna. You gotta remember this. After we're done, you're gonna complete it. Yeah, and you're gonna use that. Do it on yourself. You can make up names and numbers. I don't care. But put something in almost every box. All right. You should put something in every box. You know, and you'll uh, you Yeah. Yeah. I know yours is already filled out. All right. And we will be starting over at some point in time. But I'm picking up where we are. All right, so just so everyone kind of knows, introduce yourself, and then everybody will introduce themselves. Um, my name is Kevin Um You want me to tell a little about myself? Yeah, or? go ahead. Oh, okay. We'll waste um, 30 seconds. <laughs> so, what was your name again? Kevin Roditsky. So I got um, two Kevins. Yeah. Oh, another Kevin? Okay. Uh, I'm originally from Long Island, uh, but basically grew up in Marlboro, New Jersey. Um, my, I got divorced just now because my wife and her side of the family have always been a business processor. She's been a processor for about 10 years. With who? Um, she works for People's oh, yeah. Bank. And her mother, my mother-in-law, has been an underwriter for over 30 years now. Nice. So, um, so they've been on that side of the business. I've always told me the idea of getting divorced. Um, I work full-time as a police officer in Manal Township. I've been there for um, about 19 years now. Um, starting to think towards retirement. Sure. Think, so here I am. It's a great, it's a great move. I think it's a great move. So everything I tell you, you can go back and check to see if I'm right, <laughs> or you can check to see if they're right. Because <laughs> I know more. <laughs> okay, they don't know who you uh, are. Mark. My name is Mark Hong. I'm the uh, team leader here at Family First Funding. I've been here about a year right now. Been in the mortgage business about 17 years, and uh, he's here checking on me. Yeah, just just here. Uh, I'm, uh, Kevin's going to be on my team here. We just wanted to sit in and uh, you know, see what you guys go through uh, on, on your little training here. I don't torture him to bed. Go ahead and do yourself quick. Okay, I'm Paolo. I'm from Princeton. I travel here maybe two, three times a week. I started in the mortgage business a year ago, and uh, I am licensed for New Jersey and Pittsburgh. Daniel? Yeah. Kevin? Kevin. I'm I just, just, I just really wanted you to tell me an age. That's all. 2012 from my day job in New York after 37 years, and so I just decided to pick up something else to take my time off. So I like, keep going around. Don't stop for me. I know it's you guys. It's been great. I love it. I mean, it's a good thing to do. Tommy, uh, just sitting here, um, doing some, you know, some learning about mortgages and stuff. But, um, I really want to get on. And Tom's torturing by making them come every week. <laughs> you think he's related to anybody in this room? He's got an evil twin brother. Look, they're identical. I think they purposely wear their hair differently so your dad knows who you are. My name is Noy. Business management major. I'm still in school. It's my third year. Okay, my name is Josh. Um, I'm in Surge 365, a travel business. I'm a travel consultant. I also do social media marketing. Uh, I work in a marketing studio prior to this industry, doing like flyers, banners, et cetera. And, um, and websites. And websites. Yeah, website design. I did MCC LLC website. But now I'm looking into get this loan officer so I can start doing it, incorporating with the travel company. All right, good. Everybody knows everyone. I love it. Thank you. Um, all right, so we left off last week on income. 
Oh, Marie, did I just skip you? You did, but that's okay. It's a boys' club. I get it. I get it. I'll just sit in the corner here. Don't worry. Yet. Just keep going. You know, I was sitting like this though, and that was the problem. That's okay. I'm My sorry, hair is darling. not as great as the boys. I get it. I get it. Actually, you guys went to the same barber. Close, close. <laughs> You're not funny. All right. <laughs> All right. Good. I missed that squeaky break. Uh, no, 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 uh, yeah, you can have that. As a matter of fact, you can have that one. Oh, you didn't get one either? Do me a favor, make, make two more. Yeah, anyone else need one? You didn't get one, and you were here last week, right? All right, so make, make five. That, be good. I mean, it's just a 10 no, 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 that was the, uh, the income information. Pay stubs, stuff we gave out last week that we were reviewing from. It's pay stubs, a uh, light tax return, and stuff like that. All right, so while they're getting that, even though Marie wasn't here, we'll review real quick. Last week we went over the beginning of income, okay? And we talked about the differences of how people get paid. And it's good because I actually brought up an officer and said, even though you have a contract, you get paid by the hour. And when someone gets paid by the hour, usually means there's overtime. When there's overtime, that means we got income average, okay? Um, so we talked about when people get paid, and there's a big difference. Teachers get paid usually over 10 months. So if you calculate incorrectly and take their pay and extrapolate to 12 months, you actually give them more income. And when it, the truth comes out, it may not qualify. So some people get paid every two weeks as opposed to twice a month. Again, that alters their income. If you get paid twice a month, your check is based on 15 days roughly, and that check is bigger than every two weeks. So if you think everyone gets paid twice a month and you calculate 26 weeks instead of 24, again, you've given them more income than they qualify for, or you've cheated the borrower who actually gets paid twice a month, every two weeks. So you wanna make sure that you ask those questions. What do you do? When do you get paid? And that's the reason why in our industry, we ask for 30 days. If you have 30 days worth of consecutive face ups, not the 15th of one month, the 30th of the other month, but 30 days in consecutive and say, this is your pay for the whole month, then you can determine whether they get paid every week, every two weeks, twice a month, or once a month. Some industries like AT&T and big management people, their payroll is only once a month. They're making 180, 200,000. They get one check a month. My dad, my stepfather used to work for a chemical bank and they only paid once a month once you got to a certain level. I'm sure that happens in your field in the stock market. So once you get to a certain level, you get paid once a month, you'll only see one check. So it's very important to find out not only what they do for a living, but how and when they get paid. Next is when you look at the pay stub, you're gonna determine whether they get paid by the hour, whether it's salary, whether it's commissions, combination thereof, and that's how we start to formalize and, and calculate what they make and how we can turn around and make the deal work for them or not work for them, okay? And there's a whole bunch of legal tricks that we use. For instance, right, we can prove people on one year's tax returns. I just got someone approved on a computer and I'm, I'm going to this while she's making those copies. One year's tax return said 74,000, second year was 100,000, 15 and 16, he won 600,000. I got him a proof of 550 because I was able to use one year and go through the system and just use that one year. If I had the income average over the two, it would have brought it down, his income, and his ratios would have went up even higher, and I would have been able to make that deal work. So it's very important to know your rules and regs and understand how we're going to calculate their income. And when she comes back, we'll go over it. Anybody have any questions on what we talked about last week? You guys didn't write me notes. You were afraid I was going to take your head off or something? No? Everybody's good? All right. So if you take a look on page two, the dark highlighted box with the V says monthly income and combined housing expense information. And just to reiterate for the new guy, almost everything we do in this business is based on two years. Two years worth of income, two years worth of living history, two years worth of pay stuff, worth of tax returns, almost everything revolves around two years because you can get a, um, a good idea of what's going on. So if someone has had four jobs in two years, that could be an issue. If someone's been on the same job for two years, that could be good 
but it could also be an issue. But these are the things that we look at. Um, in the boxes, you'll see the, the income is broken down to a couple of different areas. First line says base employment income. Now that would be, when you look at the pay stub, if someone's getting paid by the hour, you're gonna see that their base pay might be based off of 35 hours, 36 hours, or 40 hours. Some employers do not pay for lunch. So you might be there from nine to five, but a half hour isn't paid, and you get paid 35 hours, because a half hour every day, well, it's 36 hours, because it'd be 36 and a half, whatever it is, you're using uh, one, two, two and a half hours. So it'd be 36 and a half or 37. So you're gonna look at that and understand, don't take his base employment and multiply it by 40, you want the 40 hours. And if you look, you'll see maybe 36 hours here, two hours there, and four hours, and then you start looking at overtime or differential pay. This is very, very important because, again, you might qualify someone. And, and as an officer, does somebody work in nights get paid different? Uh, not in my department. Not in your department. Everyone's the same, but what about the officers on the, on the field? Um, no, everybody's, everybody's the same. There are departments that do pay me. Now, I think the pay stub I pulled, the two I think it is, was working in, in the chemical plant, right? Right, the refinery. So there was a whole load of different types of pay. He had holiday pay, which was a different rate. He had vacation pay, which was the same rate, but it was vacation. And then that's how you look. And then he had differential pay, which is based on when he worked. We discussed warehouse work, work that's all shifts. So you have nine to five. 5 to 11 or 12, and then 12 to 7. That's right. That would be shift premium. So most people don't like working nights, but they'll pay you better if you work nights. You might make another dollar an hour. So these are the things you want to look at when you're doing your income qualifications and how you fill it out. So if you look at the box, you'll have base employment income, which would be his base pay, be it salary or his base hourly. And that's based on whether it's 35 hour week, 37 and a half hour week or 40 hour week. Overtime is exactly that. You're gonna look at the year to date and you're gonna kind of extrapolate what the overtime is because what I normally do is I'll take the income and let's say it's X amount of dollars over the course of the year, I'll multiply the 40 hours or whatever hours it is to that date and go, hmm, it should be 35,000, but it's 52. Where'd the extra money come from? And then that's how you start the questions. If you just meet with these people and take the paperwork and leave, you haven't done your job. You're not being a consultant. That's like you hiring a financial consultant and he takes your papers and goes, okay, I'm just gonna put you in this program. Well, he doesn't know if that program's good for you because he didn't review what your life's information is. Same answer here. Your job is to look at the pay subs and determine exactly what, what you're going to put and where to get him his maximum dollar to qualify or to make sure you didn't over qualify him and now he doesn't qualify after we've done the law. Okay. I, I should actually print this closing for approval, but I'll do that for another time. So when you do overtime, you're going to calculate that base pay over the course of that period of time. And then you're going to look at the number, the total number, which you'll see when I get mine back and I'll tell you where to look and match it up. It should say 35, but it says 52. Now you're asking questions. Where did the other money come from? I see you make a little overtime. Is it all overtime or is there bonuses? And then I determine it and I also ask the next question. What would that be? Did you get overtime last year as well? Oh, I just started overtime. I, whatever the answer is. Some guys, when they first start, they're not allowed to get overtime. Senior guys on the job, whatever job it is, make it the overtime. Okay, so you have to ask if he had it the year before. It's a little bit more difficult for you to figure out because you don't have his pay stub for the end of the year. And it's gonna be hard to get that. But what we use is the verification of employment that your processor will send out to verify what the base pay and the overtime was for the last two years. And we match it up with your pay stub. And then we extrapolate the answer from there. What so. About, what about can you still calculate if you only have one year of overtime? If you have one year of overtime, you can't use it. And if the company says it's allowed to? Well, if the company says it's guaranteed, if they fill out the form and put it's guaranteed, then we have to go back into underwriting and, and have them explain why it's guaranteed and why he didn't get it the year before. 
And it could be, hey, you're the first year in, you don't get it. Second year in, you're, you have to do three hours. There are some jobs that force you to take three or four or five hours a week in overtime. It's like mandatory in the contract that that's what you're going to do. But it would have to be similar to that. It would have to be something that's mandatory and I can see it all year long. And then there's boxes say likelihood to continue, explain overtime, and that's what your processor would get into it. If you don't have it in your paperwork, he might say, no, I have to do it. And then they're going to ask to make sure. Okay, so that's a good question. Bonuses, same answer. If you made a bonus this year and you go, look, I see bonus income. Yeah, it's based on the, the monthly numbers. When they hit right, then they get a bonus. Did you get a bonus last year? You have to income over two years. If you don't have any the year before, you're not going to be able to use it this year. Okay, unless you can tell me why. Oh, my position last year didn't have it or we're not allowed to have it. And again, it would have to be guaranteed money. I'm guaranteed this bonus. Otherwise, you got to use the two years. Commissions, same exact answer. These, these are all numbers, overtime, bonus, and commissions that you're not guaranteed. You're not guaranteed to get a commission just because you work at that car dealership. You guarantee the commission after you sell the car or after you do the loan and the loan closes. You can write five loans, but if you only close one, the commission's based on one. So again, anything that's not a guaranteed income, you're gonna use two years to average it out. Dividends and interest. Well, that's a little different and you're gonna to have to use two years in average. Usually this doesn't make up most people's um, biggest portion of their income, but some people it does, especially older folk who's got a lot of money in their retirement accounts. They'll have their social security, maybe a part-time job, and you might see ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 because they've got their money in a fund and it comes out. Again, you have to use two years. Now, for you young guys, you might not be able to get this answer, but so I won't ask too hard of a question, but when would that dividend or interest income be affected looking forward and where I would not be able to use it, even though I show two years of dividend income? Knowing your business, knowing what we do, when and how do you think an underwriter will come back and say, I can't use this? I won't wait too long. Anyone have even a thought? Maybe like multiple businesses? Like nope. Another one. Once you throw uh, for your pension. You well, you, it's in there. Well, why would you take it out? Okay. Well, you're 70 years old. Well, yeah. No. No. All right. So what if you got 300000 in your pension and you're using 100000 as a down payment and that's the money you have? You're not going to have 300000 anymore. Well, you're not going to have that same dividend. Exactly. Exactly. And the underwriter is going to question that. Where's the money from the down payment coming from? These are questions that when you're good, you ask. Hey, listen. Um, I really need to use this dividend income to qualify. Donna had a, a file from a lady from Florida. We really need this dividend income to qualify for the house that you want. Where's the money coming for the down payment? Oh, I forgot to tell you. We sold the house, and that's in another account. Great, so we're not even touching this money. But if someone's got to touch that money, that dividend income is going to have to be discounted because we can see in the file by the fact that there's no other money in another account where that money's coming from. Okay, did you give me one? Is that it? That's mine? Yeah, Thank you, I Donna. think they're in order, so it's Monday. Even if it's not, I'll just tell you where to flip what you're looking for. Okay. Net rental income. It's a very, very specific income. Net rental income would be for any real estate you own that you're collecting a rent on. Okay. Or if you're buying a multifamily, you would use a net rental income in the other unit that you're buying and you could actually use that. So there are two rules of thumb. If it's gonna be a new property that you don't have, we're going to use the leases and or the appraiser's stipulation of what that common rent is. So let's say you're buying a two family house in Elizabeth and you're gonna live in one unit. And they tell you in the real estate that the other apartment rents out for 2,500 to three bedroom apartment. Well, the appraisal comes back and the appraiser says common rents for three bedrooms is only 1800. That becomes a problem. Now there could be an answer, but this is 
what always has to be into play when you're doing your interview with your client. And you start looking at the information. These days, whenever I do an application, they tell me the property, I look the property up. I look at the taxes, I look at whatever it's rental income. You can get all the information from the listing online. Zillow, you guys know that's where you pulled all your, your listing agreements from. We use all the tools that we have available to make sure we've got the right information. But the common rule of thumb is you're gonna use the lease number as long as it appraises out, and you need to take 75% of that number, and that's what you would use as your net rental income. The only other time we won't use that is if you have an actual tax return, and you're now doing a refinance, you're buying another house, but you happen to have a couple properties, we're gonna use that actual net rental income there. You get to add back one thing. I will pull tax returns that will do that, we're doing this as a fluff, and then we're gonna look at actual paperwork that we have, okay? So the only thing you get to add back on that net rental income would be depreciation. So all my older guys, does anyone know what depreciation is? It loses value. Okay, good, good answer. So what happens is the IRS gives the accountants the ability when you buy investment property to make a tax write-off. So what they do is they allow you to depreciate, even though houses appreciate, they make it look like it's a business and you bought equipment, they allow you to depreciate and it's a fake number. Meaning I really didn't lose $7,000, it's a depreciation number. And since it wasn't any real, real monetary cash loss, you get to add that number back in and that usually squares up what you need to make it work. Otherwise, a lot of times you're underwater because of the write-offs, okay? So that would be depreciation. I'm gonna show you that on a tax return at the next meeting because we're gonna go through the paperwork that's here. So let's say on that tax return, which we'll, we will have at that point, that property is netting $2,000 a year. You have your rental income, you got your expenses, your mortgage payment, and it nets $2,000 and the depreciation is six. You add that to the two, now you have eight, divide that by 12. And you put that number in that rental income. Okay? Other. Can anybody give me an idea of other income? Come on, take a guess. Child support. Alimony. Child support, alimony, that's other income. You got other income, tell me. I have other income? Yeah, you have other income. Second job. What does an, that's right, <laughs> what does an officer do sometimes outside of his job? Oh yeah, I know, but yeah, you can do, uh, you can moonlight. You can moonlight. You're working at the bank. That's not part of your regular check, but you go to the bank and because you carry a gun in your arm, or they have, in Hudson County, they do the detail, which is a completely separate check, where they're standing there making sure the cars aren't killing anyone while they're doing work on the road. My buddy used to do that all the time up in North Bergen. He's a North Bergen guy. He used to make tons of money doing that. So other income would be something you do other than your job, okay? Um, Part-time work, you can kind of fit up there, but you could usually put on the bottom. Social Security, unemployment, disability. Some people can't work. They're disabled or they're allowed to work, but they only work part-time because they're disabled. You would write it in there. You would put a B, so if you look below, bef just before you get to the next dark box, you have a B and a C. So if you were the borrower, you would put B, you would put disability income and monthly amount. And then that amount would automatically transpose to one of the lines in the other. If it was your wife, who was disabled, and it was none of that other income, or it was alimony or child support, alimony wouldn't be there if you got remarried, you'd put a C for co-borrower, write in what it is, put the monthly number, and the computer would automatically calculate it to the upper box. That would be other income. Now, let's take a look at a couple things. So flip open the packet I gave you. So here you go. And I know we started this, but since we have some new people and you guys are new to this, I'll, I'll review this one again. So this gentleman is working for Viola North America, and the, corp the corporate address is in Indianapolis. He actually works at the refinery in Linden, okay? His regular income is based off of $44.73 an hour for 76 hours. He has overtime of eight hours, and then he had additional overtime of 24 hours. 
Anyone take a look at what his overtime rate is? It's time and a half. Well, and what's the number? 67. He also has a second overtime with a different number. What is it? Could have been a holiday. Or... Go ahead. How much is it? 67, 360, right? 67 and 36 cents as opposed to nine. That could be anything. Shift pay, holiday day, whatever it is. This period, if you go back to the top of the line, well, let's keep going down. Shift premium. His shift premium was $31.68. Bonus annual. There's nothing for this payroll, so I'm showing you how to read it through. There's nothing in rate, there's nothing in hours, there's nothing in this period. But so far for the year, he's got $3,721 in bonus. Float holiday. There was nothing for this payroll, but for the year, he's got $1,073. Retro overtime, FISA retro overtime. FLSA, retro OT. OT University stands for overtime. He made another $447. Holiday overtime, another $1,073. Shift overtime, very calculated pay stuff. Most won't be this calculated, but I chose this one for this reason, because I can give you all the examples in one pay stuff. $102.96 for the year. Sick pay, $536.77. Spot award, that's a question I'd have to ask him. $1,250. And then additional vacation pay, well, actually it's only vacation pay, $536. So. so Go ahead. I have no idea what that is. I'd have to ask him, and I don't remember. Um, yeah, I don't remember because I just didn't come average at that point. So for the year, which is 514, which is less than half the year, he's earned $53,407. Way big number based on his 31,177. His regular base pay of 76 hours every two weeks is 31,177. He's making a ton of money in overtime, and then he's got all this other additional income. This is definitely a candidate to income average. I'm going to take two years of his tax returns, and I'm going to use the verification of employment, and I'm going to income average it out. Usually the tax returns will blend in with what the verification says. But only if it's increasing income, would you average, right? If it's the, the one time that you won't use it is if you only have one year, or now most of this is pay. So if you have no overtime this year, I'm not going to be able to use your overtime for last year because you have none this year. I can't give you fake income, okay? I'm going to average it out, but she brings up a good point. If, you're not, if you don't have any overtime or shift pay or anything like that for this year, you're not going to be able to use it. The rule of thumb is 20%. If you have a lowered income in any category, even if you're self-employed, which we didn't get into yet, of more than 20%, 20% or more, you're not gonna be able to use the previous year's income. That's a situation I was using with someone who got a prequel and I had to get a copy of their info to match it up. They made 50,000 in 15 and in 16 they made 16,000. Well, I can't take that fat 50 and average it in because that number doesn't exist. I'd be giving them too much money to qualify with. So if your income has been decreased by 20% or more, you gotta negate the previous year's income, okay? So that's pretty much what she's alluding to, but I just gave you a very, very specific. All right, this pay stuff. Mm -hmm. For your edification, just take a look. Those guys that work already, you'll know, you pay a lot of money when you make money in federal taxes, social security taxes, New Jersey state, not as bad. But look at that number in federal taxes. In 53,000, he paid 10,000. That's nearly 25%. Social Security probably took another 6%, and state took probably 5.5%. And then you have unemployment and stuff like that. And if you look below it, it's very important to check this out. You got other dental, health, life. Supplemental, voluntary AD&D, 
and 401k. Now, all those items are things that if he wanted to, he could negate. So we don't discount his income by that number. He could pass on the dental insurance, the health insurance, his uh, life employment insurance. If he died, he can get paid his employment. I actually have that myself. Supplemental LTD, voluntary accident, death, and whatever the D stands for, and the 401k. So if you can negate or just turn off taking that because you choose not to take that insurance, I don't use it. That's why we use the big number. But what you want to look for are loan payments. People in many fields can borrow against their pension, which has a different rule, or they just take a loan, and you have to kind of calculate that number in as well. Okay, sometimes they have a credit union. If you borrow against your pension, there's a separate rule there that you don't really have to use the payment against the income. But if you take like a loan from a credit union, because you're part of the credit union, that loan may not show up on your credit, but it'll show up here. Okay, and your underwriter is always looking at it. So if a guy turns around and says, I'm not going to get a regular car loan. My pension is going to give it to me at 3%. And it's $550 a month and you didn't look at it. It could blow your whole deal. So you really have to look at the pay stuff closely. Make sure there are no loan payments out of it. Questions on this? Sure. All right, so read it in week, you guys that are planning to make a lot of money. The IRS is going to take a lot of money from you. 401k match. I'm going to make sure there's nothing else over there. All right. If you look at the very bottom, because nobody gets a check in what's direct deposit, this is not a check. His deposit into his account on the very bottom was $3,231.09. Uh, $3 so that's how you would read this. You got the beginning period date at the top, the ending period date, and the day you actually got the check. And you're gonna need those numbers to calculate the income. All right, I took a different set of W-2s because it was easier. So this person works at Macy's. Now here's the funny thing. You would know it, but I know the client. I know that part of that pay was salary and part of the pay was commission because he works in the store and he gets a commission for things that he sells. So here's a perfect example of you having no idea what this guy made if you only had the W-2 or the tax return. The only way to know how he earned his income is by looking at their pay stuff. So this person, Gross, if you look at the very top, it says tips, wages, and other compensation, 48,929. That's not the accurate number, though. If you look below, there's another number that says 49,790. And if you look even further down, the third box from the left at the very bottom row, what number is that? Anyone? No, oh, third box, last row, 54803. So, the reason why you have different numbers is that, again, the federal government does give you a little kickback. Flip back over to the first page. Okay. Almost all of your health benefits that you pay for are tax deductible. So, what happens is anything that he's putting in 401k, usually has its pre-tax dollars so that you can help grow the code that the IRS put in to help you save more money. The government also helps you pay for the highly inflated health insurance we all have. So you get that as a deduction. If you add back those numbers, you will find that they'll add up to the 54803. So on the federal tax number, they're gonna tax you on 4924 but you're actually on 54808. So you're gonna always have to look to find the highest number on the W-2 to match it up, okay? This will actually be wrong on the tax return. It's not gonna use the highest number because the tax returns we use are the federal tax returns and it's gonna use that federal number up top. You're gonna to see the 48 number up top, not the 54. But when you do your qualification, you're gonna do it under the qualification number. 
okay? And if it's a real big number, I tell all the loan officers, you gotta note it in your notes to the processor because you guys understand it as well because everyone, first thing they do, they flip open the tax return and they start looking at those numbers and those numbers aren't always correct. This is the true number of what you earn, and you will qualify on that number. Okay. And just, just a question. Yeah, and do me a favor. If you want to jump in on anything, yeah, no, I, I, just don't, a, don't just be embarrassed. Question. So say someone puts the number 4892. They put it, the underwriter gets it. Is the underwriter going to use the 4892, or do you think they're going to use the 54? I, I, here's my answer. Um, and you guys can excuse me because it's a monicum I've used for years from the days that I've run companies. I feel that everyone outside my four walls are morons. I don't really think they're morons, but I take the premise kind of like he feels everyone else is a criminal. <laughs> it's true. I meet you, you're automatically guilty. You're guilty right? Right? And then you got to show me you're innocent. I like that. The premise I always take is I've got to be better than the next guy. So I, if I take the premise that everyone outside my four walls are idiots, even if they're not, then I'm going to assume I have to do my job a little bit better. Because if I don't, and I rely on you, and you don't know what you're doing, then you've now dictated what my client can and will make and what they can qualify on. But my answer to you is, I won't leave it up to them. Yeah. I'm going to tell you, sometimes they catch it, sometimes they don't. It all depends on who the underwriter is and how they and look at it. And sometimes it can be a moot point if there's more than enough income to qualify, exactly. then it doesn't matter. But if you're getting tight and you're on that cuff where it, that to income starts to get a little bit higher, you gotta fight that for every 54 time. could make a break. Absolutely. Deal. You don't know how many times that 54 makes your deal work as opposed to the other number. You know, you bump over the number that allows you to qualify, you're not getting the house. Could be five dollars. If I can go, hey man, you got an extra three thousand in the bank. Pay off that loan. Now you're in. I actually had to do that on a file. Okay, they kid killed my income in another area. Okay, which I felt they were wrong. So I made the guy pay something off, and I compensated for the number. And like like Mark said, if you are easy qualifying for a loan, like the gentleman in this pay stub, his ratios were like twelve and eighteen. Even if she took some income away, maybe the differential income, she didn't know what it was. She went very conservative. I'm so far below the number, it didn't matter. And there was no reason for me to even argue because you know what? It didn't matter. I love that line. Anybody watch, what is that? Meatballs? The one with Bill Murray? Yeah, uh, well. Yeah, it's meatballs. Well, it just no, doesn't matter. Right. It, it so, just doesn't and, matter. and it's, it's really a good part of the story. It's meatballs. 70s, right? Yeah, it's 70s, yeah, late 70s. 80s. So he's a camp. Uh, counselor and the camp that he's counseling is the sucky camp they're the ones with the nerds the goofballs the fat kids fat kid. but right across the river the little lake they got is a camp with all the good looking great athlete star kids and every year they have an olympics against each other and they get killed so they're all going we're gonna play them again and he said no. do as best you can and don't worry about it you know why and they go why it just doesn't matter. If it don't matter, don't fuss over it. Move on. Don't fight a fight that don't matter to fight. It just doesn't matter, especially in this industry. You could lose your mind. And he knows. He's been working with us for now for seven months. So, yeah, if you don't need them to qualify, no reason to fight over it. Because there are going to be days you're going to have to fight for something. All right? It just doesn't matter. Love that one. And it is what it is. It's my next favorite one. I actually saw a sign in someone's office said, it is what it is. And I've been using that since I'm a kid. What do I got to do that? It is what it is. All right. Here again, if you look at the pay stuff, all these are the same. They give you multiple copies. You got to send one to the federal government. You got to send one to the state government. You may have to send one somewhere else, and they give you a couple extra so you can pay for your wall with them. Bottom line is all four of these statements are the same statement. It will break down almost everything, just like a pay stub. So a lot of times what we do is at the end of the year, if I'm doing a loan, beginning of the year, and the guy doesn't have his W-2, you know what I tell him? January and February, give me your 1231 pay stub. I know exactly what you did. Because if you look here, everything is broken down. So you, know, you learn these little tricks, which I try to tell you, but you'll catch on, and, and you'll get it as you get there. And, oh, the crap, I don't have a W-2. Huh? Give me a last pay stub. 
Last pay stub will tell me exactly what the numbers are and where they are, okay? W-2 is pretty easy to read. That's really the only trick to worry about. Look for the biggest number, and you usually find it in the state wages. All right. For those of you who probably have not filed your own tax returns, this is an e-filing page. I pulled the whole thing out so you would be familiar with what it looked like. An e-filing tax return is simple. Um, the actual accountant will do everything and send it electronically. In the old days, he had to put it in the mail, but now you get these forms. So flip it over because it doesn't matter whatever's on it, it's just a signature page. Now we're actually at a page that counts. This is a basic 1040, that's the number the government calls it, U.S. individual tax return. You will also have a NJ individual tax return, but this is a U.S., this is the federal, and we only use the federal. We don't use the, the state ones. This is for the year of 2015. It'll have their name, social security number, if they're married, their spouse's name, social security number, home address. Why is this a real important document, guys? Other than the income. That's right, what, is, what does that help me do? Go ahead, helps me verify this is a real number. Because if you give me a number, and you'll be surprised, People using fake IDs for years, you know, they, they come in illegal, they're using the cousin's number, they're using a fake number, you're gonna match up. Don't doubt once that I haven't already had a W-2 card and this number didn't match, okay? I've had it dozens of times, employees have had it dozens of times. You're in Newark, you're in Elizabeth, you're in Jersey City, where a high volume of, and people don't even realize, um, your social security number doesn't match. So, well, that was my cousin's. I finally got my working papers. I worked under their name. It's a whole load of stuff we're not going to get into. But what I'm trying to tell you is you're going to verify stuff. People are going to tell you I live somewhere. This is where I have to live in his world being an officer. I have to look at everything in here like you could be telling me a story. Bob, didn't you tell me you live in Jersey City? Yeah. Well, why does this say Highland Park? Uh, uh, can anybody give me a good answer real quick, a legit answer? Come on, come on. I just graduated college, got an apartment, and I kept everything at my family's house. It's a good answer, and it's a real answer. But Bob, you're 64. What, uh, how old are your fucking parents? Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Sorry, how old are your parents? Listen, I've seen it all. Or someone says I live in a house. I'm give, this is the things you're not gonna get on the 20 hours that you got. These are the questions you're not gonna get on the test. This is 101, mortgage banking 101. You're sitting in front of somebody and you're looking at something and it's truly, see something, say something. You can't just, well, he says he lives here. Well, it doesn't say you live here. How am I gonna do this cash out refi when you tell me this is your home and your tax return says it's investment property? That's what this does. It's further validation of the information you're getting. And you gotta match it all up. So security cards, driver's license, tax returns, bank statements, all of it has to match. Pay stubs, do you know how many people forget to change the address in their pay stubs when they move? I'm gonna tell you 80% of the people forget to do that. They don't tell their employer where they move to and it doesn't match and you're going, hey Bob, um, this says you live in Jersey City. Everything else says you live in Manalapan. Wow, man, I forgot to change my pay stubs. Do me a favor, when you get to work, let an HR know and get me a new pay stub because we got to make everything match. That's legit. You've got to tell them to get that done. You really can't get away with things not matching. What do you do if there's like, there are a lot of um, farm and jobs like, you know, in New York, they have to, you have a New York, um, in New York, you have to have New York address, but the home is here in Jersey. Yeah, so you are using the address in New York. <clears throat> well, it all depends on the deal. What do I mean by that? I had a friend who I did a loan for. Second home, people most think about second homes as what? Shore property, right? Florida, South Carolina, the beach. Well, my buddy was an attorney in Elizabeth. 
and he had a house in Tom's River. And I did a second home for him in Elizabeth in a townhouse. Why? He goes, Ed, I got to be in court early in the morning. I'm working late at night. I'm not going to drive back and forth. I've been paying rent, but you know what? I'm losing money because I'm paying rent for this. So I did a mortgage for him, and I actually proved to the underwriter we were living in reverse. His house really was where he went on the weekends, and he was up four days a week there. So when you bring that up, I look at the scenario where, well, that information may not show up in too many places other than his driver's license. Yeah. And then I kind of got to go backwards and prove it through. Some days that could be an issue for underwriting, especially when you're saying you live in a house, but your tax returns might show the right address. I'm not sure how far it goes. Normally what they did was you got to live there for two years and then you can move out. My cousin was a fireman in Jersey City. You had to have a Jersey City address to get on, get on the job. And then once you were there for two or three years, you can move. Many of the inner city towns do that. Otherwise, they'd have nobody working. People end up leaving. They don't want to stay in the city forever. Whether it's New York City, whether it's Jersey City or Hoboken, Newark, it's all the same way. So most of them only require you to live there for a short period of time. If you do have an issue like that, again, that's a red flag. You got to ask. We got to get with your manager. And we may have to get with underwriting. What do we need to prove out? So that's a very good question, though. You will see that, and you have to ask the question. See something wrong? Say something. Ask a question. It, it actually empowers you for the next time you run into it. I've gotten that answer, so maybe I can help you with, with the explanations here to move it forward. Okay? All right, so take a look at this. It'll also tell me if you're single, married, married, separated. It'll give me all the different answers here that I have to use to match up with my application. Because we're asking the same questions. Mm -hmm. We're asking the same questions on this application. Are you married? Do you have children? Well, if he says I got four kids, well, this only says you have two. Why would you tell me you have four? Or I don't have any. Sometimes people get in their own minds what they think I want to hear. Well, I got to go back and check it out. I have a son and a daughter. Okay, how, how old are they? So you can kind of put everything together and match it all up. Now comes the important part tax return. So line seven says wages, salaries, tips, etc. If you flip back to your W-2, what you're going to find, and not on this one, but what you would find is 48924, that line that says wages, tips, and compensation would be the number on line seven. If it's a husband and a wife and they both work, that number is going to be a bigger number because maybe both of them have W-2s and you add the two numbers together and you go, oh, that's where it comes from. Now, Mark can tell you that there'll be a time where the underwriter goes, hey, um, we're $20,000 off. The W-2 box says 140, but I only see 120 in the W-2s. Oh, okay. Now, even though it's a higher number, the underwriter is still going to ask, what is it? So we would have to go back and say, hey, Bob, your tax returns show you have a higher number. What's up? Oh, my wife or I had a part-time job. Or we made other money, and he didn't have it as part of his regular W-2s. Well, I need it. Okay. Are you still working there? No. I can't use it as income but I needed to prove this out to make sure everything matches. Yeah, yeah, I'll find it in my folder. Okay, so all these numbers get reviewed in detail by the underwriter and they have to match up and prove out. So you're gonna have to get it. So that box will only be for W-2 income. What do I mean by that? Is commission W-2 income? Is overtime W-2 income? Bonuses. Anything you get on a W-2. now. What does a W-2 mean? This document, the W-2, is how you get paid from an employer because you're an employee. What do you get if you're not an employee, fellas? Yeah, you guys are going to know. You should know. And what do you get? You don't get the W-4? No. 1099. I know you get it from Surge. That's why I pointed at you. So <clears throat> if you are working for someone I'll give you a couple examples. You're a subcontractor. 
you do sheetrock. The main contractor, you're not his employee. He subbed it out to you. He's going to get paid by the person building the, the development, and he then is going to cut you a check. All right, you guys were there. It's $4,000 a house. You did three houses. Here's 12000 He will make you complete the W-4 that you brought up. The W-4 is what you fill out, which determines whether you want a W-2 or a 1099, what deductions you have, and what it takes. So when he gives you the number, the check, at the end of the year, rest assured, you're going to get a 1099 from him because he's got to use that to verify to the government that he actually paid that money to reduce his gross income. You got to use that number, and if you don't count it, let's say you forget. You did jobs for 10 different builders, and you forgot one builder. You paid you 30000 IRS is going to come back and say, you're short. Something's wrong. Why? They got a statement from one of the builders saying they paid you 30000 and they added up your numbers, and it's not right. So those, those are the checks and balances of how the system works. So in this box, line seven, will only be W-2 income. You will be an employee of whoever it was that will have withheld your taxes. That's where that number goes. We talked before on that line of interest income. Line 8A is taxable interest. So I have X amount of dollars in the bank. I'm getting paid from the bank and at the end of the year, what do you think the bank gives you? It gives you 1099 for the interest because they don't take taxes out. That gets put in here. So if you made 8,000, 4,000, 3,000, 200, if it was $1.98, you're gonna give that $1.98 thing because everybody, almost everyone gets interest on their checking account. So your accountant is gonna fill that number in there. If I have income in that box for two years, I can use that income to qualify, okay? 9A, ordinary dividends. Dividends usually pertains to stock. Kevin, you want to explain to them what a dividend is? It's just the money that the extra earnings of the company get paid out per share, you know, whatever you do. So you bought, you purchased stock? Shares on. So let's say you have stock in AT&T and they had a good year. They pay you dividends because you have a stock that requires them to pay you dividends. It's like interest on your money. Okay, it's not just value, but you also get paid an income. That would be a dividend income, and I need it for how long to use it to qualify? Two years. Two years. That's right. <clears throat> number 10 is taxable refunds, credits, and offsets. We really don't use that number because we already have it in your gross number before. The government taxes you again. So let's say last year you had a $3,000 refund. They're going to hit you again this year on your $3,000 refund. It's ludicrous, but it does. We really don't use that number. 11, alimony received. And you could be a guy and get alimony. So if you are receiving alimony as an income, and that's your main source of income, or maybe you got a part-time job, you're only making 20, but you're making 5,000 a month from the poor guy who divorced you. Have you ever seen a guy get alimony? Yeah, I have absolutely seen guys get out of money. Have you? Yeah. I used to do consumer lending, so we have quite a bit of it. Yeah. Yes. What does that mean? Huh? What does that mean? Oh. He doesn't know what alimony is. Oh, you don't know what alimony is? Are you married? All right. So some of you guys are more experienced than alimony. Yeah. You married? No. So good. Kevin, tell us what alimony is. He's got many. <laughs> Please, Kevin, share. Yes. <laughs> it's a uh, court mandated pay that they have to pay your ex-wife. Or ex-husband, whoever was making more. Well, yeah, either one, right. She can pay you, actually, too. Now, these days. Right, so let's say, let's say you marry someone who's got a real good position. Right. To keep up their, their lifestyle. lifestyle they had while they lived with you. One of my favorite comedians, Bobby Collins. I love Bobby Collins. I got five wives. They all got houses. I'm broke. <laughs> they all have houses. All right? So alimony would be income that you receive from a spouse because they made more than you. And the government feels you deserve that number. In some cases, rightfully so. Or more than that. Or more than that number. But it has to last hey, more than three years, though. You, yes. have to, you have to be getting it for at least six months. Okay? She brings up a good point. 
So you have to be getting it for at least six months to qualify. For FHA, you only need three months. It's important. So you have to be getting it. You got to prove that you're getting it. These guys will tell you, you will have a divorce decree. And in the divorce decree is a settlement agreement. And in the settlement agreement, it'll stipulate how much you have to pay in alimony or how much you're receiving in alimony, depending on whether you're the payor or the payee. It'll also stipulate if you're paying or receiving child support, okay? So you have to be getting that income for at least three months for an FHA loan and at least six months for a conventional loan, period. No three and a half. You got to wait. You, got, you could start the application, but by the time we close, you should have had to receive six months or three months, depending on the product you're using. Now, if your kids and you're using child support to qualify, well, we'll stick with alimony first. We'll go there. So let's say you're stipulated to pay for 10 years. It'll say on there to pay till December 1st, 2020. And we're in. 2017. We have more than three years or less than three years right now? We have more. We're ahead by a few months. If I took this application in January of 2018, I can't use that income to qualify because that income has to be continuing for at least three years. Or if you're getting child support and it says till the age of 18, sometimes it stipulates out of college, but a lot of times it will say 18. If the child is 16, you can't use that income to qualify because you only have two years left of that income. Once that child's 18, you're not getting it anymore. But you won't see child support on an income tax report. You have to ask them, are they using any type of paying other income to qualify for the loan? You ask. That's exactly right. That's why you have to ask all the questions. You have any kids? I don't know I receive child support. People who receive alimony pay tax on it. Child support is not taxable, so it's not disclosed. Okay, but you're going to see it in your divorce decree. Checks and balances again. How would you know that they're divorced? Tax return. You'd be on a tax return sometimes. Sometimes it shows up on credit, but not always. Okay. Huh? You wouldn't know that because I'm looking at the picture right here. You know what I'm saying? But there are certain ways and things that pop up. When they do searches, when they do a search, because it's a legal document that's filed there, I mean, they can't do it. So they do it. The payor of alimony doesn't show up on his tax return. Just a guy, just a lady or the man receiving the money. So we've had cases where it got all the way to the end, and it turns out they were divorced because it showed up in the title search that that was filed. Okay? So these are all questions. You, that's why that application says single, Married, divorced, unmarried, whatever the box is. And when you say unmarried, I would say you're single. Yes. It says unmarried, you know, that's a problem. Because if he was single, he would have said single. When you said unmarried, that means something else. An old divorce. So, so the mortgage tip of the day, <coughs> get married, you don't have to pay alimony. <laughs> <laughs> no well, and, oh, oh, and, oh, that's, a, that's a different story. Yeah, well, we didn't go there yet. <laughs> Child support. Let's see. Oh, you're, you're, if, well, if there's a stipulated time frame, it'll be there. If there's no stipulated time frame, you will pay that until one of two things, one of three things happens. The first one is you're dead. If you die, you ain't got to pay. Number two, if she's dead. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Oh, I'm yeah. telling the truth. <laughs> and you know, only men think that that's funny. Okay? If she <laughs> dies, if she's dead, you ain't got to pay. And number three, if she remarries okay. or he. So if you remarry and she's paying you. That's, that's right. It's over. You got, you got a new sucker. Yeah. Or you, you are the new sucker because you got remarried and she was paying you. All right, let's Either just way. move on because it's just not a very nice conversation. You'll all be Either very way. lucky if you find the girl that will marry you. That's right. Bless the and God stay with you. I think it's the other way and put up I'm up. married 28 years. I got no complaints. No, I don't. I really don't. You can do that because your son's not here. Who 
Oh, I, I, what, are you kidding me? He defends me. <laughs> are you kidding me? He thinks my wife is out of her mind. Hi, hi Lulu. <laughs> <clears throat> Again, we all joke. But, yes, you will pay until those three things happen. One of them. Remarried, death of either party. And I never said this wasn't going to be fun. Yeah, we're going to have fun this way here. <laughs> all right. Business income or loss. So if you have a business, and I will pull more tax returns that will have those numbers. If you have a business, you, you will get it over in this line, and there are a number of ways to have businesses. So you should write this down. In line 12, you could either get Schedule C income, which means it's Ed's towing, or, or, or E and L landscaping, Ed and Lucille. It's your business. It's not a corporation. You'll be on an S. You, you are a Schedule C, self-employed, and you'll have a document in here that'll do it. I'm not going to go into detail on it until I get the actual form, but I'll pull one out for you. Okay. Next line would be capital gains or losses. Capital gains and capital losses are simply this. You buy a house for $50,000. You put $10,000 into it. Your cost is $60,000. You sold it for a hundred. You had a capital gain of forty thousand dollars. I bought it for fifty. I put ten in. I sold it for a hundred. Sixty minus a hundred minus sixty is forty. It's a capital gain. You buy a stock. I bought a thousand shares at a dollar. I spent a thousand dollars. The stock went up. It's worth two thousand dollars. I sold it. The broker took out a hundred, right for his fees. I got nineteen hundred. I paid 100, my capital gain is 900. So you can, have a, you can have a gain or a loss. I bought this house, I paid 100, I put 50 into it, I only sold it for 140. I have a capital loss, okay? And then you use that against capital gains. But that would be a capital gain or a capital loss. Something that you bought for a profit, and either you profited or lost. IRA distributions. Now, that could be a good thing and it could be a bad thing. If someone has income in an IRA distribution, but you don't have it every year, you can't use it as income because what you're doing is you're depleting your IRA. Now, if you got 100000 in the bank and you're taking out 10000 a year, well, I'm going to have it. I show for two years, I take 10000 out every year to supplement my income. Well, I can use it because I can say I have it for three years because it's 100000 I'm taking 10000 out. So I did it two years. So three more years makes five. I even got five extra years. Okay. So IRAs and pension distributions have to be so for two years. Let me give you a normal occasion where you're going to get a distribution. You left a job and you needed the money. Maybe you got let go. Maybe you took a job. It didn't work out. And you had 30000 in that IRA. And you said, you know what? I need the cash for whatever it is. The government will take out their taxes and you might get out of 30, 19 to 21,000. Okay. It's a one time event. I can't use it as income, but I'm now retired and I'm now taking distributions off my IRA. That distribution is only going to last for three years and I've had it for two. I can use it. Okay. No, cause I just want to make sure. Um... We also have a program for asset depletion. If someone's got money in the bank, They'll let you calculate it out. We have, we have that. I just didn't print it out for us today. But in this case, it would be you're taking your withdrawals every year to survive, whether you take them on a monthly basis, a quarterly basis, or yearly basis. Most would take it on a monthly basis, right? That's a lot like Kevin's world with the stocks. In it. I only know as it relates to what we do. Rental, real estate, royalties, partnerships, S-Corps, and trusts. All those other business. So remember we talked about rental income? If you own the property, it's not part of the new property, it would show up in this box and there would be a schedule in here that you would use and it's carried over to the front. Government likes it nice and neat. Your tax return could be this thick, but they have everything on this one page. This one page is where they calculate from, but then they go back and check the docs and make sure it makes sense. But basically, if you have a corporation, so let's say I own this company. I could own it in Three venues. I can have an S Corp. I can, no, no, four. I can have a C Corp, an S Corp, and an LLC. I'm sorry, three, I was correct. So, what's the difference? 
an LLC is a limited liability corporation. It kind of protects you. And you own shares of stock in that corporation. So let's say me and Kevin over there were partners. We would be, we would be um, part of the LLC. We're both equal. So in the LLC itself, we would be 50% partners or 60-40 or 80-20, whatever the number is. An S corporation is a little bit better than being a regular company because what it does is it protects you in case somebody slips and falls on your property. A lot of people will drop their properties either into S corps or LLCs and it gives you a little bit of protection from lawsuits. It'll protect your personal assets, your home and things like that. If something happens in the business and you get sued. A C corp is a completely separate entity. C Corp will have its own tax returns. They're called 1120s. I'll get copies of all that for you. And when you get an income, you may be taking it on the W-2, and then you may take a distribution, just like you could with the other two. That income would be here, or that loss would be here. And the, and the documents would be within this total package underneath. You would look for it to see what it is. Because sometimes you need more income. A lot of times, and in, and in being in this venue, here's what's going to happen, because it happened the other day. So, how much do you make? I make 300000 Great. If I was you guys, I would have wrote 300000 divided by 12 is 18245 And then when you got the tax return in, he would have netted $84,000. And you go, Arr! you can't buy this $600,000 house with $10,000 down at $84,000. It's not going to work. Plus, you have a Mercedes payment of eight hundred. Your wife's got a BMW with seven fifty. Okay, the numbers don't add up. Yes, he made three hundred, but that was a gross number of the business. Then we had all the expenses. He had to pay the girl at the front desk. He had to buy the material. He had to do this. He had to do that. He had to pay commissions because whatever it was, and he netted eighty. So it's very important that you ask a specific question. How much did you pay taxes on? I don't want to know what the business made. I want to know what the net profit was that rolled over to here. Because I can have five businesses, and all those numbers would add up in this box, just like if I had five W-2s. Okay? Very, very important. Big mistake. I've made it in the early years. You won't make it because I'm telling you. If you do make it, I'm going to beat you up with the tax return when you show it to me. I told you this in class. All right. Farm income. Well. You're not really going to have too much of that, but that would be income based on a farm. You have a farm, you sell stuff, you have horses, you sell the manure, whatever it is. That would, that's where it would go. Unemployment compensation. Very, very, very intriguing. Um, does anybody have an idea of how somebody would get an unemployment income every year? Go ahead. You're going to throw me out the best ones. They're union workers. That's a good answer. I was waiting for someone to say they suck at their job and they get fired every year. <laughs> All right. So if you're a union worker and you're working, you work building houses, building construction in New York. Well, you might have a snowfall and you're out for three months or there's no work. It's not like you can't keep a job. The job you're on finished and you have no work. You immediately are allowed to go apply for unemployment. So you may a couple times a year collect unemployment. So if that happens to you, and I can show a two-year history, I can income that average out for this year, okay? Because in reality, you made $84,000 on the job and $18,000 off the job, and it happens consistently. Last year, you made $65,000 on the job and maybe $28,000, because what happens is more work, less unemployment. Less work, more unemployment. It evens out throughout the course of the year, just like a C <coughs> okay? You can't collect that and work. No, Simultaneously, right? No, if you take another job, a different job so even if you take a different position, you right. can't collect that. Right. So, if you're a union worker building a building, and someone says, "Hey, come work, work," um, well, if you come work for me on the side and I'm paying you cash, it's a whole different story, and I'm not counting. But let's say you took a job. Um, your buddy's got a landscaping business, and he paid you hundred bucks. You would then use that income, okay? And then you may have to explain, no, I had unemployment the year before, so it's kind of the same thing, all right? Another thing is, you know, if you look at other businesses, um, people who work in the 
picking, like out west in California, they pick the crops. Well, they only work for half the year, okay? So that kind of works. By the way, if you work a full-time job and you go away to college, you can collect while you're in school. Didn't we find that there is also um, a lot of uh, the union workers in Isaacin's case? He paid into a fund, and even though he was unemployed, rather than collecting unemployment, he took from the fund that he paid into. Right. So we always have to ask, you know, if you are, did you collect unemployment? Yes. Did you collect un unemployment from another source as well? Exactly. Always ask the questions, especially when your numbers are tight. <clears throat> and you'll learn as you move down the line, different businesses will have very similar situations. Union workers of all type, framers union, carpenters, um, steel workers, because uh, framers can be still in wood, longshoremen, they all have jobs. They don't, for example, my wife's cousin is in the union and he runs a dock in Bayonne. Whenever the boat comes in, crews, they call him up and say, boat's coming in at eight. He shows up. And he manages everything that goes on. Boat leaves, he's not working. He doesn't show up to work unless the boat's coming. So he gets paid, he doesn't get paid. He gets paid, he doesn't get paid. He gets paid a lot when he works, but he may not work for another week if there's no boats coming. In. So they always try to schedule work. So you definitely have to ask all those questions. That's why we go through this. Unemployment. So security benefits. So let's go back to... I'll give you a couple of examples that you won't even think about. So one of your parents passes away. So if it's in a case like my brother-in-law got killed on a motorcycle, his wife, even though she works, received unemployment or actually was compensation for his death to the two kids because he was the primary wager. So he received 36, she received 3,600 a month, was split into 1,800 and 1,800. So she had her income plus that income. And what do we have to verify? You said it before, you have to be getting that for three more years. That ends at 18. It reduces if you go to college. It doesn't completely end, but you still can get it, but it, it kind of gets reduced as you get older. Pretty much it's supposed to end at 18 now, like then you go out and get a job. Um, but if it is a um, death benefit, and you're collecting it for more than three years, you should be able to increase it by 115%. Though. Yes. So that gives them a little- We have another, another little caveat that any type of income you get that's not taxable. So your social security, non-taxable portion, we multiply by 115% and you can use <laughs> a bigger number. So if you made 100,000 for a round number, you would use 115, divide that by 12. Why? Because we use gross income, remember? We didn't use the net 3,200 here. We're using the gross number up top. So because just because you're getting a net check and you're not paying taxes on it, you're being slighted by the fact that you don't have a gross income. You got one check. So we allow it to gross up. The same thing and in many cases, it's 125. Yeah. It's 125%. Because remember the taxes? 10,000 off of 53, it's almost 25%. So they gross it up because you're not paying state tax, federal tax, FICA tax, you're not paying those taxes. So they allow you to gross it up, okay? But a couple examples are you're retired, you're collecting social security, even if you're working and have a pension. Um, death benefit, like, like you, death benefit, someone died, or you're disabled. You were a longshoreman and you used to make a lot of money. You had an accident on the job. You can't work as a longshoreman anymore so you get compensated by the government to not work as a longshoreman, but maybe you got a job as a computer tech. You went to school, you got your thing, and now you're doing IT work. You still get your social, your social security for disability, and you get your income. Okay? They allow you to do that in cases because you can't do the job you were trained to do. Now you got to do a different job. It's kind of weird, even if you're making more, it happens. But that's where you would see that income in that box. All right, now, the next, the next set of, of lines is adjusted gross income. These are all things the government lets you deduct and so you don't pay taxes on the higher number. The only time it's really an issue for you, and I'm gonna see if I don't have it here, 
I'll do it on the next one. The second page gives you some basic tax benefits. And this is a simple one. That's why I chose this one first. Gives you some deductions for kids, for taxes you paid on your house, and, and health insurance. That's where those numbers come in. If you've made any payments, and if either you owe or you're getting a refund would be on this box. So in this case, he was getting a refund of $5,045 because he paid seven into it, and when he had his deductions, it reduced it. Sign here. These returns have to be signed prior to going to closing. And if there's a tax preparer, you want to make sure his signature is on it. This person here got a deduction. If you flip over to the next page, 24414, Child and Dependent Care. Health Savings is another deduction. So some of you have, uh, if you take an insurance policy, a health insurance, where you have high deductibles, they allow you to put a health savings account that's pre-tax dollars. So every month or every payroll, I take 100 bucks out of my check, pre-tax, and it goes into a health savings account. So when I have to pay the deductible or buy prescriptions, it comes out of here. And all these are separate forms that go in to those deductions on the last page. Now, like I said, I chose this one because it's a little bit simpler. I'm going to pull another one out for next week that will have self-employment income. I'll try to find another one that's got a corporate tax return on it so you can take a look and see what they are. But I kind of calculate my time out to 11.30 so I know what to go over. Any questions? I'm not in a rush. Anything on this that was confusing? go back yeah, it's a C corporation. Okay. A C Corp is an actual corporation where the business is treated like a separate entity. It will have its own tax returns, and they're eleven. They're called 1120, 1120. So under that type of corporation, normally you are a regular employee. So when I owned my mortgage company, it was a C Corp. I got a W-2. I never took any cash out of it. I ran it like a regular corporation. So I was an employee of the corporation and wrote myself a regular check with taxes coming in. Okay? That is like a real corporation. The C corporation would be Kmart and Walmart, things like that. Big companies. And they could be small companies. They grow to big companies. And some companies go from an S to a C, C to an S, depending on how it benefits the owner of the business. An S corporation is a corporation that's formed, but it doesn't have its own tax return. It's part of this one, okay? So a C Corp would not fit in that line. Let me read the line. Schedule C. So in 12, I wouldn't get anything on a schedule on a, on a C Corp. I would show it on my W-2 line. An S Corp would show up on the line for corporations which was line 17. So even though it's a corporation, it's an S corp, which really means it has a corporate title, but it's really part of my personal returns. But it gives you, the owner, the ability to be protected from any kind of business um, lawsuits and things like that, and keep your personal assets safe, as long as you follow the rules, which we're not gonna get into, because it doesn't matter for our qualifications. But that's what an S corp does. It's kind of like an LLC in a different venue. Okay. What's the main difference between that and an LLC? An LLC is a limited liability corporation where you have partners. The C oh, Corp okay. is pretty much your own yourself. All right, all right. So if I have partners, it would be in an LLC. Yeah. If I have an S Corp, I really can't have a partner because it's part of my tax return. Right. Okay. So if, if Kevin and I went partners on a building, we would put it in an LLC. I couldn't put it in an S Corp because he wouldn't have any ownership. An S Corp is only mine. We could, we could put that business and make it a C-Corp and have a whole separate tax return. Right. Okay? Questions? Anything here? Issues? Problems? He's going to be asking a lot of questions tonight. He's out cold. 
<laughs> we got to get up a little earlier. All right, we're good. Next week, I'm going to pull out Schedule C's. All right. That which is regular self-employed. I try to find an S-Corp or an LLC and a regular corp. Regular corp doesn't matter, but I pull out 1120 so you know what it looks like because you'll need it. Okay, you will need that. Give examples. Law offices are usually LLCs. Okay, why? Because every, everyone in there might be a partner. They may have other employees, but you may partner. Well, if I had a C-Corp, I couldn't make you partner. Okay, you could own stock, but it really couldn't make you a partner. If I have it in LLC, that's why they call limited liability corp. Well, you know what? You've been here five years, you're doing a great job, you're doing a lot of money, I'm making you a partner. That's how that comes out. Doctor's offices are usually partnerships in LLCs. Okay. Um, they have their own tax return, and then your dividend money comes in through there, and I'll try to have one for you for next week. You good? All right. Close out. Thank you, gentlemen and ladies. Bye, guys. Bye. There's one question. No question for Catherine. Do you clarify? Do you count loan against pension borrowing or just a loan against the credit union? Um, if the pension loan is collateralized by the pension, and can be wiped out by it, which is why you get the pension docs, then no. But a credit union loan, you're going to count against it because it's an actual loan. Maybe I used it to buy a car, or I took it because I had personal, I was going to go on vacation, so I took a loan from the pension. So in many cases, I'm um, sorry, in many cases, a pension loan, you can negate the payment, but a credit union loan, you can't. You have to use it against his uh, DTI. Is there an ATM? Uh, there's a couple of banks.